Well, let me invite you to get your Bibles out and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, you know we have been in uh, our winter Bible study of 2 Corinthians and uh, Brother Lowry has done a wonderful job uh, as he led us all throughout the month of uh, February and just really given us a synopsis, hopefully creating a hunger in your soul so you'll get uh, into that book. And if you have not read it and reread it, it's good to do so. One of the things that I would encourage you to do, I don't know where you are in your reading of Scripture, but sometimes it's good to read out of the Old Testament and also out of the New Testament uh, in your reading. When you get to, let me encourage you, if you don't have an open windows out front, get one and start a systematic reading. Why? Because it's important to do so because it just feeds your soul. Well, you remember that uh, before we was in our winter Bible study, we began a series on heaven. You know, uh, I guess probably one of the uh, most often asked questions that a pastor will get through his ministry is, uh, Pastor, what is heaven like? What's, what are we going to do once we get to heaven? Uh, what, uh, what can you tell me? What can I look forward to? Uh, how will we know our family and our friends and our loved ones? What does Scripture say? Because the truth of it is, you don't live on this uh, earth very long without really having a yearning and a longing to go to heaven if you're a child of God because the Bible makes it very clear that you and I have been born of the Spirit of God. So there is something on the inside of us that wants to be completed and that's that eternal life and so someday it's going to be consummated, it's going to be fulfilled and we're going to experience all that God has in store for us. But let me take you back just a little bit. You don't have this in your outline, uh, all of it comprehensively, but I just want to take you back a little bit and remind you of where we have been. You remember that we have been dealing with uh, where is heaven? You remember I shared with you uh, in the first message, some people say, well, uh, what about heaven? Where is heaven? And uh, who is in heaven? And I shared with you that uh, it's the throne of God. You know, Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, don't swear by heaven because it's the footstool. It's the throne of God and earth is the footstool. It's the place of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's the place of myriads of angels. It's the place of the redeemed of the Old Testament, the redeemed of the New Testament, our family and friends who have died in the Lord. And there's so much more that could be said about that. But you and I just need to be reminded that it is the place of God's throne. That's why it is so serious when we talk about heaven. Because it is the habitation of God. And uh, time won't allow us to talk about the size and the enormity of heaven, but think about it. Since God is all-powerful and all-knowing and the supreme being of the universe and all-encompassing, imagine what the size of heaven must be like if heaven is the throne of God. And uh, it's a vast eternity of eternities. But we shared that with you. And also, secondly, we shared that it's real. You know, sometimes people want to make it a figment of their imagination. And you'll hear this, and I've heard it through the years. Well, if you want to believe heaven is a real place to help you out, then that's all right. Whatever gets you through life. Well, there's just one problem with that. What if somebody else says, well, that don't help me. And third of all, if heaven is not a real place, Jesus is a liar. Because 130 times in the Gospels, heaven is referred to as a real place. Jesus made it very clear. He told the disciples, you're from below, I'm from above. He said, uh, and he talked about the throne of God. He talked about heaven. And uh, you remember when uh, he ate with his disciples, he said, I'll not eat at noon until I eat it in the kingdom of heaven with you. And so it's a literal place. Heaven is not a figment of the imagination. When our family and friends have left this world who are redeemed, they have gone to a real place where they're going to see the real Lord, they're going to see a real uh, environment, a real world. And you remember we dealt with some of that in our study on the Revelation. But suffice it to say that you and I need to understand that it's a real place. And so whenever we leave this world, we don't go to a figment of imagination. We don't go to some make-believe place. The Bible makes it very clear. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. Now think about this for a moment. And here's... The whole eternity, the whole eternal nature of Jesus rests on this. If heaven is not real 
and Jesus has declared it to be real, then Jesus has declared a lie. Because there's a law in the universe, it's called the law of non-contradiction. In other words, a statement cannot be both true and false at the same time. And so if Jesus is saying something is and it is not, then he has borne false witness. Well, what would that put him do? That put him also in league with those who say wrong things and lie and, and other things. So it's a real place. And then I shared with you that it's the home of the redeemed. You know, uh, one of the things that we have faced in recent weeks, and we've watched some of our family, we've watched some of our loved ones who've walked out of this life, and they've gone on to be with the Lord. And the Bible makes it very clear that it's the home of the redeemed. Imagine the horror and the terrible consolation if we didn't have heaven as a reality, if it was a figment of our imagination. Well, you remember Paul the Apostle declared, and I'll give this to you before we get into our scripture tonight. He declared that he knew a man that was caught up into the third heaven. He's referring to himself. But... Paul and John and the others, they were so sensitive to speaking of themselves that they didn't want to speak of it in the first person. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12 2, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one was caught up to heaven. So it's a real place. But you, you remember we also ask, where is heaven? And the simplest answer to say to that is that, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to go into all of that because there's so much to cover tonight. But you know, the moon is 211,000 miles plus from this place. You know, you could walk to the moon if you walked uh, 24 miles a day. You could walk there in 27 years. Uh, you know, Saturn is 790 million miles away. And if you travel by light years, which is 186,000 miles per second, it would take you a while to get there. But, you know, whenever you and I leave this world... Here's what the Lord says about us. Now, it's a world that is so far from this earth we can't comprehend the distance. But here's what the Lord says. With me, absent from the body is what? To be present with the Lord. So we know that heaven is up. And so what's heaven like? And of course, I shared that from Ezekiel, from Revelation, just some things about it. You know, the radiance, the color, the majesty, the thunder, the lightning... The, of the glowing of the, of the radiance of God. And uh, when you examine Revelation 4, 6, uh, it, it's beyond our understanding and comprehension. But just listen to the verse. Uh, Revelation 4, 6 says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass likened to crystal, and the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So what in the world is God saying through John? He said, I want you to un understand that you can't understand what heaven is going to be like. And to put it simply, the Bible says, I hasn't seen nor ear heard or entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So we're not going to be able to understand, and you can't understand all in this body, but I'll tell you this, there are some things that we can know, and that's exactly what I want us to look at tonight. Uh, you know, the Bible makes it very clear, and, and if we're going to understand a little bit about what we're going to be like in heaven, let me take you back to the beginning of Genesis and just capsule what took place in Genesis for just a moment before we examine what we're going to be like in heaven. Now, you understand that when God created Adam and Eve, He created two perfect individuals. They were sinless. They did not sin. The Bible says God put them in the Garden of Eden and they were naked and they weren't ashamed. In other words, there was no taint of sin. There was no thought of temptation. There was no thought of lust, uh, though they were there and God put them in that environment. And so God put man and woman in the Garden of Eden in a state of perfection, in a state of innocence, and they were there. And then you know the story that uh, Satan came along, the serpent, and uh, he tempted them and they yielded to the temptation. And sin has crept into the entire universe. As a matter of fact, sin has crept through every molecule of this universe that you and I see and that we don't see. In other words, every strata of the universe has the taint of sin on it. In other words, if you could go 25 billion miles away, it has the taint of sin on it. This world has been impacted and infected with sin. You don't have to look very far to find that. 
You don't have to listen too much to find people who it's just, you know, it's just profanity and profanity. Why? Because our world is showing how dead it is. Now, let me stop here and just say this. In the book of Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve in a state of innocence, in a state of perfection, in a state of wonder, and they sin, there is no place from the end of Genesis to Revelation that says God has changed his plan. In other words, when Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth, he came so that he could reverse the curse process. Do you follow me? You and I are under the curse today. But whenever we die, the curse is removed from us and we get to see and experience a world where there's no more curse on us, there's no more curse on our body, there's no more curse on our being, and we get to enjoy a world of wonder upon wonders and and that's the way it's going to be for all of eternity. So I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 through uh, 50 is what we're going to look at tonight. Because they were asking Paul the Apostle about the resurrection of the dead. They were asking about what, what the body, what the man is going to be like. And so Paul is addressing that in 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty five. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God gives it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. These are all celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also, now he's just comparing everything that's happened to this verse. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body and so it is written. The first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it? That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the, is the Lord from heaven. You need to underline that. That's going to be significant in a moment. As is the earthy, so are also the earth. As is the heavenly, such are they also of heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now there is so much to say in that passage of scripture, but I'm going to synopse it tonight because there really would just take so much, much time. And I'm going to give you some of the highlights Out of this passage. Now, one of the things that Paul is making very clear to the saints of God, he said, I want you to understand that God has given to everything a body that that suits him. In other words, animals have one type of body. But in the animal kingdom, there's all sorts of animals. And you have a dog has one type of body. You have a cat has another type of body. You You have the sea animals. You have all of those. They have a different type of body. And then... You have the little microscopic things. They have one type of body. And then you go to the macroscopic things. You have the sun and you have the stars and you have the moon and you have the galaxies. Everything has a body that God has designed for it. Now, there are bodies that God has given to uh, his, uh, to you and to me. And our body differs. We differ from animals. We differ from birds. We differ from reptiles. And so... 
when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, something mysterious, marvelous, and wonderful happened to you, to every legitimate Christian. God placed inside of you that kernel of eternal life. Now, why do I say kernel of eternal life? Because you are not yet fully developed as God wants you to be. No matter how long you live on this earth, you're not going to be the fulfillment that God wants you to be. Just like you put a kernel of corn in the ground and uh, you watch it. I'm going to sow some corn a little bit later on. And uh, I'm not going to go out when it comes harvest time and get me a little pouch and gather up the corn. No, I'm going to have to get a wheelbarrow. Why? Because it, it grows, it matures, it gets a different body than what I put in the ground. And so God makes it very clear. So I want you to understand you're going to get a different body than what you have here. And uh, our soul has been redeemed and God has planted his new life in us. But here's the reality. And here's what you need to understand. You are still waiting for the redemption of your bodies. In other words, you're not going to completely look like this in eternity. I'm going to be me, but I'm not going to be what you see here. Uh, there's going to be a tremendous glorification. I'm going to be me to the fullest extent, and I'm still not all of me that God wants me to be. Now, don't ask me to say that because that's a tongue twist. But the reality of it is neither are you. God has placed inside of you eternal life. You remember that Paul said to the saints at Corinth, he said, if any man be in Christ, he is what? He is a new creation. And there is something on the inside of us that groans for our heavenly. But let me just give you a few things out of this text of Scripture that uh, reminds you and that shows you what we will be. First of all, we will be perfected. Now, Paul makes it very clear in the text of Scripture that he says that we're sown in corruption, we're going to be raised in incorruption. And to understand our perfection, here's what we need to just give you a little example. This is just the reality of it. Okay, a person dies and their body goes into the ground. Their spirit goes to be with the Lord. Now, the spirit that God has saved, the spirit that God has redeemed, God releases them from a body that was racked with pain and problems and sickness and diseases. But when we go to be with the Lord, here's something that happens, and, and God himself only knows how he does it. When God examines your spirit, when you arrive in heaven, God finds not one molecule of imperfection in you. Do you realize that every one of the people we know who died in the Lord, they are perfect upon perfect upon perfect because God has scrutinized their spirit. And so, you know, we placed our faith in Jesus Christ. And how can God declare us perfect? Not because we lived a perfect life, but because we placed our faith in Jesus Christ as the full payment for our sins. And my mother, when she went out of this life and her body is still in a cemetery in New Tazewell. I go and visit her grave sometime, but I know she's with the Lord. But here's what I know about her. That when she arrived in heaven, she arrived and experienced full perfection. Now, her spirit is absolutely perfect. Now, she don't have her body yet, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. But she is absolutely perfected in the presence of God. And uh, you remember the verse of Scripture Paul stated in 2 Corinthians. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation or a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So those who die in the Lord will never have another defiled, imperfect moment for the rest of their life. Listen, there will never be another negative moment for any of your family or my family who's died in the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful thought? To know that they're never going to have another negative moment for the rest of eternity. Now that should help us whenever it comes to coping and dealing and facing a life maybe without a spouse or a mother or a father. And uh, because God makes it very clear, there's not going to be any perfection. And sometimes we say, well now, so and so, they weren't the best person in the world, but they were saved. They 
arrived in heaven and what they experienced, God scrutinized their spirit. They placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And they experienced, once they arrived in heaven, absolute perfection. Why? Because they were redeemed by the blood of Christ. That's why I say to you that the kernel of everlasting life is on the inside of the truly redeemed. And, uh, you know, Revelation 21, 24. When you read the last part of Revelation, you find that there's no one who practices any abomination or does any lying forever. Think about it. The world we're living in, we, we, we say, you know what, I'm so sorry to hear of your loss. And I'm sure if they would say, I'm so sorry you're living on the earth. I'm so sorry you're still on that earth. You know, with all of its sin and infestation and wickedness. And, and, uh, and, and God makes it clear through John. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And so the first thing that takes place when we arrive in heaven, we experience, we behold full perfection. Now, listen to me very carefully. We've had some good days in our life, but we've never had good that somehow is not mixed with some bad, right? You know, you have some, some negative, some bad times. But God makes it very clear. First of all, we're going to be and we're going to be perfected by God. Our being is going to be perfected. And I'm going to get to the body in just a moment, but I need to preface it with this. Well, second of all, we'll be perfected from temptation. Now, all of our earthly life, we face one temptation after another. You stop and think about it. You don't live long without facing a temptation. You've been tempted today. I've been tempted. All of us face one temptation after another. But when we enter heaven, here's, what, here's the reality. You're never going to know another lustful thought. You're never going to know another thought, a satanic attack for all of eternity. Why? Because Satan is not going to be allowed in. So he can't tempt you. His demons can't tempt you. And, uh, you know, we will for the first time experience the reality that we're what God purposed us to be from the creation of the world. Now listen carefully. You cannot comprehend what God has purposed for you. We get a little idea in this life, but Paul said, and it's so true, we look through a glass darkly. Satan has a way of bombarding us and we get all confused and messed up. But uh, here's what uh, I want you to understand, and I love this. One godly writer said this, and I want you to look on the overhead. We will be, we will be at the apex of comfort Every moment throughout eternity. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. One theologian said the zenith of your life is the age between 30 and 33. Another doctor said that's where we are cellularly. In other words, your cells are at their zenith between 30 and 33. Now most of us are past that age. But imagine this for a moment. Imagine your best moment at the age of 30 to 33... Your best moment, your best day, your best hour, your best second. Whatever that may have been. And amplify that a thousand fold and it's never going to change. Well, if you could do that, you might get just a little bit of an idea. And here's the reality. You and I are going to be at the apex. We're going to be at the zenith of comfort every moment throughout of eternity. There's never going to be a negative Experience. There's never going to be a negative moment. There's never going to be a negative day, a negative hour. And so, uh, and the point is, we'll never have another bad day for eternity. Our family who's died in the Lord, they're never going to have a bad day. And you say, well, if, do they know that we're crying? Do they know that we miss them? You leave those things to God. But I can just tell you this. God will wipe away all tears and, and there is no sadness, there's no sorrow. And, and think about it. People who have experienced death, the man who uh, died for 90 minutes, John Piper, 90 Minutes in Heaven. If you've never read that book, you need to. It's a very good book. And he talked about how he had died for 90 minutes and a man came and prayed over him. And he said, he talked about what he experienced. He talked about the music in heaven. He said, I can't even describe what I heard in heaven. I can't describe how I felt when I was there. He said, I just knew that everything was wonderful. It was all right. He said, it wasn't like going through a tunnel, seeing a white light. He said that wasn't it at all. But the bottom line is he talked about what he felt and what he experienced. And here's the thing about it. When you, when you think about the best moment of your life, at the prime of your life, at the moment you felt the best in your life, 
Imagine that for eternity. Well, that's just a, a little picture. And so, thirdly, we'll be perfected to experience total goodness. Now, Jesus made it clear, and you can turn to the Gospel of Luke. You have it in your outline. But in Luke 25, the rich man, the Bible says, Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Here's the wonderful reality about the moment you arrive in heaven. You are comforted, and you are comforted for the rest of your eternity. And, uh, you know, we're going to have bad experiences in this life, challenging experiences, some hard experiences. But listen to what he said about Lazarus. Now he is what? Say it with me. Now he is comforted. In other words, there's a release, there's a freedom, there's a joy. And that's got what's going to be for you and for me. And so we'll be perfected to experience total goodness. And that's in essence what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. He's reminding the saints of God. And then fourth, we'll be perfected to receive a new body at God's timing. Now, I want you to listen very carefully to this point. At death, we are separated from our bodies. Now, you will not find in the Bible uh, anything that says about a body that we have before we get the new glorified body. The Bible is silent about that. I heard one uh, godly preacher said, I don't know but what we might have an interim body until the time we get our glorified body. That may be so, but the Bible is silent about that. But have you ever thought about how much you do and how much you interact with other people apart from their body? Let me give you an example. How many of you have made a phone call today how many of you have sent an email today or sent a text today? You couldn't see that other person. You didn't know what that other person's body was doing, but you was interacting with their person. When I make a phone call to Charlotte, I don't see her face to face, but I'm interacting with her person. I hear her voice. She's talking to me. I'm talking to her, but she don't know if I've got my legs crossed or she don't know if I'm typing something. She don't know if I'm... You know, she, she don't really know what to do because you can interact without the body. You see, the Bible makes it very clear. You are two parts. You are outer man and you are inner man. Let me explain. My thumb cannot experience joy, right? I have never tried to calm my thumb down because it's so excited. My thumb don't know how to experience laughter. My big toe does not know how to experience grief. You know, if Charlotte called me one day and said, What's going on? Oh, honey, I need you to pray for me. My toe's in grief. And she'd think, You need to come on home. We need to go see somebody. Because your body relates to this world. This body relates physically. You know, I walk, I move, I, I, I breathe, I can see you, you can see me, and every one of us are a certain size. Have you ever noticed how, how torn up we get over our, our, just our structure? I mean, some people, I mean, they really get depressed over the gravitational pull of their body against a weight, against scales. And, and, and yet God makes it very clear, Paul makes it very clear in this text. He said, we have a natural body. And uh, while you don't have your glorified body until the day the Lord, you know, resurrects the dead in Christ, our outer man will be buried, our, our inner man will go on to be with the Lord. Now, sometimes we say, well, you know, that person can't relate then. Then they can't talk to others. No. Think about it for a moment. Do you think you're going to have less joy in heaven after you die than when you was on earth? And we draw some wrong conclusions because we always think, well, I have to have a body. No, you don't have to have a body. You don't have to have a body to fellowship. You know, we're made to have a body, and that's why you're going to get a brand new body someday. God is going to see to that. But at God's time, and the Bible makes it very clear, we're going to receive a house from heaven. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 2, For this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. In other words, you're going to get a body 
that is unlike this body. And I'm going to give you some, some information on that body, so get ready. The time is going to come, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And what's going to happen? The Bible says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why? Because, think about it. Those that have been dead for 2,000, 3,000 years, they have been waiting for their body. They knew they was going to get a body. They have been longing for their body. Now, they're able to interact. They're able to fellowship. They're able to interact because Paul makes it very clear. Absent from the body. In other words, I'm out of this environment. I know I'm out of this environment. But when I die, I'm with the Lord. I know I'm in that environment. I'm enjoying that environment that I'm experiencing. So those who have died in the Lord will have their perfect spirit. But here's what will happen. They will be reunited with a glorified body. So what are we going to be like whenever we're resurrected? Well, let me just give you a, an idea of, of what Scripture says. And uh, there's so many things. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, I want you just to look. In verse 44, he said, It is sown in a natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Paul is saying, you have a body suited for this earth. And the body that you have now cannot be suited for heaven. You couldn't live in heaven with this body. There's no way you could. You couldn't do what God wants you to do in heaven with this body. So this body is going to be done away with. I'm still going to be Benny Bush. But if you want to get a picture of it, just get an idea. And God gives us good pictures and shadows Take that little uh, lowly caterpillar. That little caterpillar goes on top of the grass and you'll find him in your driveway, gravels, or, you know, in parking lots. And you'll see that little old caterpillar. And then it uh, goes into that cocoon and it experiences a metamorphosis, a transformation. And when it comes out, it has a different body. Now, watch this. Same, but different. You're going to be same, but different. Let me just give you an example. God makes it very clear that we're going to have a heavenly body. You're going to have a real, literal, tangible, touchable, visible body. I want you to understand that. You remember when Jesus Christ was resurrected, he was resurrected and he had a real body. So let's look at the body to come. First of all, there are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies and there's a body... Uh, you know, for earthly organisms and for those that occupy space, sun and stars. But uh, Nancy, if you'll move on to the next slide and let's give them what the body looks like. First of all, notice it one more time. We're going to be like Christ in bodily form. I want you to hear that and I want you to absorb that. We are going to be like Christ in bodily form. You say, now wait just a minute, Pastor. What's the basis of that? Look in verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. What is the heavenly? Well, Paul only knew of one who was from heaven, and that one was who? Jesus. He knew one was from heaven, came down from heaven. And you remember when Jesus was resurrected? That is the picture. He is the prototype of the new resurrected body. And uh, now, was Jesus the same height as his earthly body? Probably so. Because when he was resurrected, you remember that some had mistaken him because there's a little bit different, uh, there was a difference to him and they recognized him by his voice. But first of all, we're going to be like Christ. Verse 49, Jesus had a heavenly body. You're going to have a heavenly body. Well, next, notice what it says. We're going to be incorruptible and in an eternal body. Now, you know that, but here's what you need to understand. Your body is going to be suited for the world you need to live in. We don't live in an eternal world right now on this earth. We're going to die, we're going to leave, but we're going to be resurrected and we're going to have a body 
that cannot be corrupted. What does that mean? It cannot age. It is ageless. It is undefiled. It cannot be corrupted in any state, in any form, in any way. Why? Because Jesus said the former things are, are passed away. So the body is going to be designed of, of God. And then next, notice what it says. When you have a body that is fit from heaven, you have the capabilities of the one who is from heaven. You remember that Jesus, he descended from heaven. He came in the form of a virgin. But when he ascended, the Bible says in Acts one uh, eleven that uh, the disciples were there and they watched him. And he ascended out of their sight. In other words, he went up without any strings. Without, he had the capability. Why? Because he had a body from heaven. Now, if you could see Jesus right now, you would see him in bodily form at the right hand of God the Father. He still is in that resurrected, glorified body. And, you know, that's exactly... And so we're going to be like Christ. And that's why you have the kernel of eternal life. That's why there's a yearning inside of you. Well, next, not only have the capability, Jesus walked through walls. And uh, if it necessitates that you need to walk through a wall for an eternal assignment, you know, Jesus uh, was not limited by time or space... Uh, after he was resurrected. And of course, he walked through the crowd even beforehand. But the point is, in the glorified body, he had the ability to walk through walls. In other words, there was no need. There was no, you're not going to be limited to time or space. What speed are you going to travel in the new body? Some of the best theologians that I, that I have read said you will not travel at the speed of sound which is about uh, 600 miles an hour, you won't travel at the speed of light, which is about 186,000 miles a second. Can you imagine you personally traveling at a speed known only to God? Now you say, that, that's just unreal. It can't be so. Why not? That's why Paul said, I want to tell you we have an earthly body designed by God to live on this earth, but, you know, you look at Jesus, he wasn't limited by space. In other words... You know, the molecules of this body, I want to show you, I want to walk through this wall. I want you to watch me. Now you're going to say, Pastor, you're in for a rude awakening. You notice that I'm not taking any steps either. Why? Because I know this body is designed of matter. And uh, you say, Pastor, if you don't mind to walk into a wall, it won't matter. Uh, But uh, I don't want to get bruised up. But the point is, You know, he was not limited by time or space, and neither will will we. Well, next, notice this one. His body shined like with amazing glory, and so will ours. Now imagine, now this is, and and, and the, the thing about it is, you and I need to understand is, a lot of folks who say they're saved are not saved. If there is not a yearning to go to heaven, if there is not a hunger and a desire to to want to be with the Lord, then, you know, sometimes you might need to back up and say, is that person really, really, really redeemed? Now, I'm not saying you want to go today, but any Christian somewhere along his or her life, there is that yearning. I've yearned to see the street of gold. And by the way, it don't say streets. It says street. I don't know how long it is. The gates of pearl. The the walls. And so his body shines with amazing glory. Why? Because of perfection. And you're going to have a body like Christ. Your body is going to shine with amazing glory. It is not going to have a sin molecule about it. You're going to never know the thought of temptation. never, Never a thought of yielding to temptation. There is going to be in your heart and in your desire system a yearning to glorify God for the rest of eternity. You see, everything we do down here, we're we're tainted with our our limitations. Because think of what we do. And think of things we say. Well, how long is church service? Because we're human. How long will it last? Because we're human. Uh, I hope it don't last too long. I can't hold out too long. Because we're human. You're never going to age. You're never going to tire. In other words, it is never going to happen to these bodies. 
We're going to have a body that shines with amazing glory like the Lord did. And that's exactly what it says. And also next, his body had no limitations. Now, notice I did not say you're God. Sometimes we think, oh wow, we've got a body like his. and Are we going to be God? No, there's only one God. Expressed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You're not going to know everything in heaven. You say, well, why aren't we going to know everything? Because there's only one being who is all-knowing, and that's God. We're not going to be all-powerful. That's only God. But here's the point. His body had no limitations, and that's why he said, you know, we're his children. And uh, we're in the family of God. And think about it, no limitations. Never having to sit down, never being tired. Wouldn't you love to be able to work forever? Now, see, you hear me say that, you say, oh, glory, no. But think about working and you can't wear out. Working, you can't get tired. Working, you don't need to get a drink of water. And the thing about it is in eternity, and I want to tell you something, you're not going to even need to eat in eternity. You know, wait just a minute. I didn't say you wouldn't eat. You wouldn't need to eat. In other words, you remember when Jesus was resurrected. I want to ask you to turn back there because our time is running out. But I believe it was in John's gospel and also in Luke. He told him after he had been resurrected, he said, bring me what? Bring me a broiled fish. What did Jesus do with his resurrected body? He ate that fish and it was digested. Because he was hungry? No. Because of the fellowship. You see, one of the things that we do a lot of, and we may not need to do as much of it, but we like to do Don't you just like to eat for fellowship? You know, you sit down and you have a piece of cake and maybe a piece of pecan pie and maybe you got some whipped, uh, uh, whipped cream, or maybe a apple, piece of apple pie and some ice cream over top of it. Or maybe you got a piece of chocolate pie making myself hungry. But you do it to enjoy fellowship. And, and the thing about it is, is his body had no limitations. Yours won't. You won't have to eat. You won't need to eat. But you will eat. Why? Because it's a part of fellowship. And then next. Okay, I think that was the last one. And so we're going to have a spiritual body. We're going to have a body that God has designed for us. And so, you know, our body will be a body of splendor. You'll have a body that's beautiful. You'll have a body that is dazzling, radiant, and ours will be a body of splendor with no pain, discomfort for the rest of eternity. I want you to notice this next statement. Our body will be raised in power that will last forever. I look and I'm not as powerful as I used to be. When I was in high school, bench press, you may not believe it, but there was a time that I did 350 sit-ups every night. I can do maybe three plus five. Maybe I can do the last one, do zero. But... Our body will be raised in power. There will be a power about your body. And here's what you and I need to understand. We should groan for heaven. John MacArthur said this. We should groan for heaven like freedom is grown for a prisoner. Like health is grown for a sick man. Like food is longed for by one who is hungry. We should long for heaven like the farmer does the harvest. And if we don't, something is wrong. Don't you ever think... Something's wrong with you if you say, you know, Pastor, I just think about heaven. I guess I think about heaven too much. The truth about it is, the average Christian don't think about heaven very much at all. But I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that body. I'm looking forward to getting what God has in store for me. And right now, this, in this body, I have a little kernel of it. I'm so far from being all that God wants, but God has put his kernel of eternal life in me. And he has given me his Holy Spirit as the down payment guaranteeing me that someday I'm going to be what he wants me to be. And I'm going to be like him. You're going to be like Jesus Christ in bodily form. 
You're going to have the body in a very similar way to what he has in heaven. You're not going to be the only begotten son. That's reserved to him. But you're going to have... And if you want to get a picture of it, go back and read the post-resurrection. Because he's the prototype. The Bible calls Jesus the first fruits of them who raised from the dead. What does that mean? He's the first one of how many more will come after him. You know, when you get the first fruits, maybe that first tomato, maybe that first mess of corn. You say, honey, we've got the first fruits. So what are you saying? You're saying we've got the first of many more to come. Jesus is the first fruit of what you and I are going to be like. And you're going to have the apex of comfort for the rest of eternity. So why shouldn't we give everything to the Lord while we're here serving Him, loving Him, praising Him? And then whenever we get ready to lead this life, we'll be with Him and never have another negative for eternity. And God's people said...